Today, I'm going to talk about graph neural networks in Allegro Graph. Uh, I am Jans Aasman, and what you see here in the picture is my colleague, Kenyo Gu, who did all the work on the graph neural network stuff. So this is a, a, a project we did together. Um, so the contents of this talk is um, some, some use cases where we need more than regular machine learning and graph analytics, right? We do a lot of machine learning already, but sometimes you need more advanced technology. And so I'm gonna talk about why graph neural networks. Is there anything wrong with regular machine learning? And then I'm going to talk, most of my talk about a big uh, graph neural network example and a demo with Allegro Graph. Uh, the use case is uh, actually an, uh, a database that's freely available. It's a series of news events, but I'll also talk at the end about how we apply the same uh, technique to medical data. And if you want to try it yourself after this talk, we have a Jupyter notebook for you and a Sparkle endpoint that you can play with. And if you need more help, we're here to help. All right. So why did we have to go in graph neural networks? So we here in the company um, help other companies build knowledge graphs, but we have a specific kind of knowledge graph. We call them entity event knowledge graph where and this applies to almost every uh, a company, you have a core entity that you really care about in uh, telecom, it's a telecom user, right? In healthcare, it's a patient. And then what we do is we take, through our data fabric technology, we take data from various silos, data about a patient and make that events on top of the entity, right? So basically we turn a patient in a series of events and then, we do analytics and well, the most important question is then, can I predict for any patient what's going to happen next, right? Or for a telecom user, what is the next thing he's gonna complain about? Or what did we learn about a particular company we're calling in a call center? Anyway, this all works great, but sometimes you need a little bit more than just machine learning. So um, if you look at the use cases that we have, what have, what have they in common? Well. You always want to classify an entity, for example, what is the health status of a patient of this aircraft, of this customer. You always want to know, hey, what is the next event that's going to happen? What is the next disease for this patient? What is, ne what is the next thing this customer is going to buy? And you hope that your data is good enough so that you actually can understand, right? Or you can explain why an entity did something, right? And so usually we use for this uh, recurrent neural networks, LSTM and other, and graph analytics to do event prediction usually with great success. But with all these techniques, especially RNN and LSTM, you don't use the context uh, uh, information around an effect, right? And then you want something that is a little bit better than these techniques. So why graph neural networks? Um, so regular machine learning is actually perfect for Euclidean data sets, right? If you have a grid, if you have a series, then people have been working for 30, 40 years on machine learning techniques, and um, they've gotten really good at it. So the technique is very, very robust. You probably have seen these pictures on the internet where you have uh, a, a object recognition where the objects are different variations, different colors, different shapes, and the technique still, the, the machine learning technique still can deal with it, right? So it's super cool technology, but, these, tech, these, these machine learning techniques fail when you have a graph, right? So for example, you see here a graph with ISIS in the middle and you see all their enemies in there and, uh, and friends around it. Actually, ISIS doesn't have any uh, 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 friends, but what you see is that the world is very complicated. Like, like the USA might have a friend in Saudi Arabia who has another friend, but then in the end, it turns out that just, that you, they have an enemy that's also the enemy of the USA. So how can you predict uh, who's a friend or who, of, of, of a particular entity in this, in this system, right? So, um, so for this, you can't put it into a, a regular machine learning factor because actually you have a recursive problem right here. So you need something else. Well, where are all the places where graph neural networks really helps and where regular machine learning fails? So for knowledge graphs, it's entity classification. If the graph around the entity is important, right? It's for relationship prediction when the context is important, or if you find particular shapes in the social network. Now, obviously regular machine learning 
can't help you there. Um, and so what people normally say, what you use uh, uh, graph neural networks for is for node classification. What kind of node is this in this network? Graph clustering, can we find subclusters that are important? And link prediction, should there be a link between t uh, these two nodes or are there nodes missing, right? So those are the primarily use cases of graph neural networks. Um, here's an example of link prediction where graph neural networks do a great work. So for example, you have this graph on the left-hand side, right? You have B and A here with a link in between, and you have D and C without a link. A task that you can give to a graph neural network would be to give it a subgraph like this, and then say, hey, should there be a link between B and A? Or you give a subgraph like this, and you say, hey, would there be a link between D and C? Well, if you look at this graph, you think, well, they, they kind of have the same common neighbors. They look very much like, like uh, each other if you look at what they point at. And then there's some other things that we intuitively know and we say, well, yeah, there's probably a link between them, right? So here's some techniques that people use. And then for this one, we would say, well, they don't have shared neighbors, right? And uh, they look very different within the graph context. There's probably not a line. Well, basically what I just explained, that's what a graph neural network does, right? It looks in various ways at these nodes and it will determine whether or not there should be a link. Uh, the same thing for relationship extraction in a graph. So people use mostly uh, um, regular machine learning for sentences. But if you really want to go deeper, then you see when you look at a sentence and you look at all the ways you can parse it and look at the relationships, there's a lot of back uh, pointers within a sentence, right? And then again, people are starting to use graph neural networks more even for uh, language understanding. And then you might have seen things like this where people try to describe um, complicated pictures, right? So for example, a machine learning object is very good at predicting whether something is a cat or a dog, right? But what about a person that is sitting on a horse in front of a mountain? How do you represent that in a factor? You need something else and that something else is a graph. And you see here are people using it to do a mixture of object recognition and taking the content of a picture and turn it into a graph. And they actually, and let's not go into here, and they even can do it in a reverse direction. You can even say, hey, there's a man throwing a frisbee and he's right of another man who's behind a boy on a patio. And nowadays you can find beautiful examples on the internet. You give a description like this and it will come up with a picture like that, right? So a very exciting new technology for this. But we're going to um, apply it to an, yet another example. And that is basically an example that's based on an article that came out a few years ago. It's called Recurrent Event Network Autoregressive Structure Inference over Temporal Knowledge Graphs. And the authors definitely thought it was a breakthrough, breakthrough but even the, um, the, the reviewers were pretty impressed with the fact that they made a big leap forward in looking at temporal sequence of, of, of uh, uh, symbols and predict the next symbol in a network. So for example, what is this about? You could say, hey, North Korea is making a statement about South Korea at T1. So here's time one, time two, time three. North Korea said something about South Korea and about Donald Trump. Donald Trump criticized Iran, but he also criticized Pakistan. Then at T2, um, Macron consulted with Donald Trump. Donald Trump uh, praised the protesters in Iran and he threatened Pakistan. And now the task of the neural network is given uh, that I have something know, given that we want to know something about Donald Trump at a particular time, could we predict who he was going to threaten or who he's going to consult, right? So that is the task of the, of the, uh, the, uh, the, the graph neural network in this particular graph. Um, a little bit more about this graph. Uh, these are events recorded from uh, January 1st, 2018 to the 1st of November, 2018. It's an open source data set that you can download as a, an organization, ICEWS, right? That actually does a curated effort to extract the data from a network. You also could use GDELT, which is Google's kind of news database, but that's not curated. Anyway, 
Within this data set, there's 23,000 entities. One of them is Donald Trump or Iran or the Netherlands or whatever else an agent you saw in, uh, in, 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 uh, in the news in that year. There's 256 event types that connect these entities together. together. So you could have positive ones like uh, praise or uh, collaborate. There's neutral ones like consult and there's very negative ones like threaten, right? So all kinds of events. And in total, the database has about close to half a million events, yeah? And the, basically they took the nine months and divided them in days, right? And this data set is actually very actively used by political scientists to predict future political interactions. Um, all right, so we took this data set and we put it in a graph. So let me just show you in a little demo how that looks like. So here, I think if the database already open and say, uh, I wanna know about Donald Trump, right? And so here, Donald Trump and say, I want another actor in the world. I could take uh, maybe uh, Vladimir Putin. And here I get Putin. And then anyone else that you can think of, I mean, Maybe just for fun, Iran, right? We've got There's a lot of Irans here. Yeah. Uh, one thing that you see here, there's a very high level of granularity, right? You have the finance minister of Iran who's an, who's an actor in the database, but let's just take the country Iran, right? So now we have two humans in a country, right? And uh, just for fun, we can even ask, uh, the pictures, it will go to the Wikipedia and get the picture. And I have no idea what the picture for Iran is going to be. Oh, it's a bunch of horses. Okay, something from the old Persians probably. So another question is, how are these guys linked, right? So I can, I'll just show you all the predicates in the system and I'm just gonna take uh, two uh, from, as two predicates that I wanna use to connect these guys. And I said, let's connect Donald Trump and Iran. And it's going to look, and it's probably find, oh, at least 200 paths. So let me just, some accuse, accuse of something, appeal for diplomatic cooperation, which is a little bit positive. There must be something positive, right? Uh, well, okay, let's just take, now please note, there's many, many more, right? And I can also say, what are the relationships between Donald Trump and, uh, and Putin, right? So I can say what well, this one here. And this is both positive and negative there. So if you wait, it finds again, many, many, this several, it's probably more than a thousand. We have consult, accuse, uh, all these guys like to confute and, and deny responsibility and discuss by telephone, right? So now we have a little bit more and let's just do Putin to Iran right here. So we take him and we look at Iran, this relationship there. Oh, actually there's too many. Let's just keep it like this, right? So we have this here and then we can look at Donald Trump, right? And so here you see uh, the buildup of the network, right? You have Donald Trump, I could look at uh, him and we see he has an ID, Donald Trump, he's a human, there's a picture of him. And then you see all these things that people say about him. I could say there's probably almost 5,000 things that people say about him, <laughs> um, but let's, let's just keep it here, right? So I hope it makes sense to you that this is the graph. So now let me go back to the presentation, right? Well, maybe one more thing. I can also show you what people say over time, right? So we actually have a time feature in the system, right? So if you wanted to, Right, you could look at over time what people said. Right, so he is accuses, then he accuses Iran, then he appeals for diplomatic cooperation with Iran, uh, then he discusses something with Vladimir Putin, then he accuses Iran again. And anyway, <laughs> this is a wonderful way to actually play with this data set. Right, well, let's go back to the presentation, PowerPoint slides. So, so here we are. Um, and I showed you this, right? I used some other people in my presentation. So there's various things you wanna do, 
with this data set. Yeah, with our graph neural networks, right? You could say, well, what if you look at the interactions between two people like Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin, right? What happens the most? And so you do this Parker query here. There's an event from Donald Trump to Vladimir Putin. And the 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 event has a predicate name and a sentiment, right? And then you basically count, just like a relational database, you count how often these happen, you order by descending count, and now you see that Donald Trump mostly consults with Putin, then expressed intent to meet and negotiate, etc., going down. And here you see the sentiment. So we did an extra step here at Allegro Graph by adding sentiments to each of these relationships so that we can also look at this general sentiment. So here consulting is zero, and you see there's some positive neutral ones, and then there's a whole bunch of negative ones here too. So that's between Trump and Putin. Uh, we can also look at Putin and Trump, right? You can see he's way more positive to Trump than Trump to him, um, although there are some negative ones here, right? Um, and because we have these relationships and we have the sentiment, we actually can compute the sentiment between people, right? So here you could say, okay, for every event from Donald Trump, Trump, find everyone else, look at the sentiment and then take the average of those sentiments. So you see that uh, Trump is uh, incredibly positive to Switzerland and Belgium and Ireland, right? Um, and then, <clears throat> but if you look at Vladimir Putin, it's still positive, 0.35. And, but I also can show you a whole bunch of very negative ones, but for now, let's just skip that part. So this is from Trump to other people, but you can also say, what is the sentiment from other people against Trump, right? And then you see suddenly that Singapore is wildly enthusiastic about Trump. Uh, Poland too, and the cities of South Korea. Um, but then here you see that, uh, let's see, where's Putin? Oh yeah, here's Putin, 0.41. Putin is also relatively positive about Donald Trump, right? So all kinds of stuff that you can do without any neural networks, but it's already interesting if you're a politician, political scientist. And then there's asymmetries in relationships, right? So for example, what is, what, what does Trump do or say to Iran? What Iran never does to Trump, right? That I, I expressed that sentence in this uh, uh, Sparkle query here. I'm not going to explain it. So, uh, but I'll, when you get this presentation, you can try it for yourself. And then basically, you see that um, Trump threatens 31 times. And, and then when anyway, you can go down the line here, but it's kind of funny to see it the other way that uh, Iran, right, never does all of these things that you saw on the previous page. They only reject proposals to meet, reject plans, and bring a lawsuit against, right? So it's, I find it very interesting to see the asymmetry between people and especially between power, power centers. So, and then you, I can keep going. One thing I really uh, was interested in who in this entire database threatens the most, right? And I find it very interesting that, China is so high on the list, sorry, India is so high on the list and criminal India, I have no idea why that is. But I also can look at who threatens, who gets threatened the most, right? And then the citizens of India, I, who, I don't, well, we can figure out by doing queries, United States, Iran, um, but then you won't find Trump at the bottom. So somehow most people don't like to, didn't like to uh, um, threaten Trump. Okay, so anyway, I, I just gave you a taste of what it means to work with this database, right? So now let's add the graph neural network. So we, we took all these relationships that we have and we put it into PyTorch and, um, and then we uh, started looking at event prediction, right? And so the thing is, if you have a sentence like Mali signs a formal agreement with the World Bank, right? At a particular point in time, could you then say, um, if I know, that I have Mali and signed formal agreement. Can I can I predict that it was the World Bank or the other way around? Uh, if I have a sentence signed formal agreement with World Bank, can I then predict that it must have been Mali? Yeah, based on previous events and everything else around Mali, right? And so here I have um, this little subgraph in in our knowledge graph. Yeah, so we see that. Uh, the green lines are from, the black line is true. So there's a 
formal agreement at this stage from Mali to the World Bank. And then I can go um, to, I, I can take this query that I saw there, put it in the query editor. And the only thing I do is I uh, uh, made this event into a variable and I click on run query. And then I get the result, signed formal agreement. Oh, sorry, you see the sparkle that got generated from this visual query. And then you see that signed formal agreement was the predicate. Um, now, this is not a URL, so I can push another button. Actually, I can see that the button that the signed formal agreement actually is 313382 as an event, right? Event 313386. And now I can start do predictions, right? So I can say, if I have this event, yeah, can, could I have predicted, could I have predicted that the World Bank was the one that was the object, right? And so here you see, when I do this query, you see that the neural network actually predicted that World Bank was one of the people that Mali signed an agreement with. Unfortunately, if I do the same thing for um, the other way around, can I predict the subject of, the, of this particular event that we hear? It doesn't happen in the top 10. Okay, I should have mentioned our graph neural network that's built into Allegro graph only gives you the top 10 back. And I also should have mentioned, by the way, <laughs> that this predicate that you see here is not a real predicate. This is what we call a magic predicate that will actually talk to the graph. It's, it's a function, they call it magic predicate. And so this one here is actually a function that talks to the neural network and then gives you a result back, right? So we integrated that part of the graph neural network directly into Allegro graph. I hope that's clear. Um, so now we're going to talk about how good is this graph neural network actually, right? So let's just get the thousand objects, random objects in January, right? So for the people that can read Sparkle, we say select the from event and to at a particular date. And then we say we take the 1st of January 2018 as the start. We take uh, the 1st of February as the end. And then we say give me every event from a person to a, well, from an actor to an actor at this date where the date is higher than the start and less than the end, right? And I get a thousand results, right? So we have a thousand results. But now the question is, of these thousand results, how often did the graph neural network actually predict the right object? Yeah, so we take the same query we do have here. So what you see here, when you look at my mouse, this is the identical question query that we just did. This part of the query will give you back a thousand twos, right? And a thousand events. So what we added is given this thousand, how many times given this event did I predict the two? And we see that 784 times the two was predicted correctly, which is very, very high because you have to think about what the poor graph neural network has to do, right? I mean, there are, there's 23,000 actors that it could choose from, right? But it 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 um, it has to predict only one, right? So the fact that you got 784 means that the graph neural network actually did really, really, really well. So this is for the objects, right? Again, try to remember uh, there was a statement, right? And we wanted to see if we could predict the two part. We could do the same thing for the subject part. Yeah, so now we're in the next slide, it's actually the same beginning, but now we say, could we have predicted the from or the left-hand side of the sentence? And we get 717 time, which again, is also pretty good. Um, now, unfortunately, it's not that when you predict the two correctly, you also predict the from correctly. It's kind of mixed up. So if you say, hey, give me the thousand events in January, right? Then I only want to keep those where we corrected the from correctly for this event and the to correctly for this event. And then we see 589 results. So that is actually, again, pretty good because again, you have to choose from 23,000, right? And I, I'm very impressed by how accurate the graph neural network worked in this particular case. Um, as I said before, every time when you make a prediction, you have to choose out of 23,000 actors. Um, when you will look at our Jupyter notebook where we do this work, yeah, 
you see actually uh, that we had to run this, this neural network about 20 times before we get to a level that was good enough. And here you, you see some measures for how good the system was. Hits, one thing that's important is we call hits at 10, meaning if you do a, a certain number of predictions, how often, what percentage of the time does the result happen in the top 10 predictions, right? And we see we get almost to 50% of the times you do it correctly um, for both the, the right hand side and the left, left hand side. And the other measure you see here, it's the MRR, means the reciprocal rank. So let me just explain it in a few sentences. Yeah, and this, by the way, comes from Wikipedia, where say you have three words and you have to predict the plural of this word on the left, right? Well, say you have a system that uh, first proposes cat and then kati and now cats, then the cats is the correct response, but it's on the third place. So the reciprocal rank is one third, right? And then you see the same example for Taurus in, in virus, right? And so you see that you get three measures for these and you have three of them. So if you take these three and you divide it by three, then you got about 60%. So that is what MRR means. So let's go back here, right? You see that you get to like 0.3, meaning again, that in the world of graph neural networks, this is a really, really pretty high number. Also note, by the way, it took 43 minutes to compute this on a laptop with eight, eight, uh, eight cores, right? Um, all right, so another thing you'll see in the um, uh, Jupyter Notebook is where we looked at 10 times the statement. For example, the ground truth is Donald Trump made a statement about Japan on this particular date, right? And then if you look at predicting the objects, he didn't get it right at once, right? Or here you see Donald Trump make a visit to Ireland. And again, it was not predicted. Uh, but here are a few where he did predict that Donald Trump accused China. Well, he accused China all the time, right? So he got that right. But also Donald Trump expresses intent to meet or negotiate Mu Jae-in. And here you see he corrected that they did it right too. So now the question is, you see four out of 10 times he got it right here. That's roughly the percentage that you saw in hits at 10, right? Could I have done this with simple statistics? So here's the thing that I always tell people that ask about graph neural networks. Um, is the results you get, or are the results you get better than what you could have gotten through regular analysis or not? I just saw a talk by Amazon uh, where they showed uh, using a graph neural network uh, to predict what kind of movie someone would like to see. And then they, for example, would predict, and, and they have movies that have 90 categories, one of them, whether a movie is romantic or not. And then they predict that a particular person wants to see a romantic movies. But the point is that person usually watches romantic movies. So if you just <laughs> counted the number of romantic movies, then you say, well, 20, 20 to 30% of the time, this person looks at romantic movies. Well, then if you just, recommend any romantic movie already good to go right so anyway this so in those cases it's not very surprising what the what the gnn does but sometimes when the data are not very big or very sparse then suddenly it does surprisingly well right so just let me explain that for example we look at donald trump right you say uh select actor and then count actor as count so count how many times we do it correctly Sorry, how many times uh, Donald Trump says something about someone else, right? And then you see in the newspapers, very, very often it's about Kim Jong-un, right? In North Korea, Vladimir Putin, China, Russia, Iran, Shinzo Abe from Japan, etc. right? So now if I just um, look at the predictions again, right? And I look at these statements, then, if I just took the top 10 of, of that regular distribution, right, then I would get it six times right, right, for these 10 sentences. And this one is orange, but because uh, Shinzo Abe was the prime minister of Japan, right, so it almost counts as Japan. So, I mean, there, uh, the graph neural network doesn't do better than just regular statistics, right? But if you look at whether it did correct for predicting that 
that he was going to visit Ireland, then, well, then you can understand why Ireland didn't work because Ireland is all the way at the bottom, right? So, and if you then also look at the statistical relationship between Donald Trump and Ireland, then you can really see why the graph neural network never would get it right. What you see here is what we call an odds ratio diagram, where we look at co-occurrence between actors, and then we correct the co-occurrence with the, how often A and B happen in the entire population. And then you get kind of a surprise factor or correlation factor, and you see that Donald Trump is like four steps away from Ireland. So I wouldn't predict he would ever do it right. But on the, for Mali, you know, you saw that the system predicted correctly for Mali um, that uh, it, it did a sign agreement with the World Bank. And then I would never could have done that with the regular distribution because Mali is all the way at the bottom here, right? Uh, if you look at all the people that Mali communicates with, then the World Bank is here, right? But that's for all the cases here, it's like almost one in 50 but it still got it right. So I'm kind of surprised by that one number. Um, but from the World Bank to Mali, Mali, I mean, World Bank deals with so many people that Mali is all the way at the bottom, right? It happened only one time in the entire year. So in that case, it couldn't predict it at all. So, I, well, my, maybe one more little statement, but if I look at the GNN, so we have, of course, in our semantic knowledge graph, uh, a semantic reasoner, right? So in many cases, when you use a reasoner, you add more knowledge and facts based on logic inferences. Think of a graph neural network just as a probabilistic inference engine, right? It also adds more knowledge to your system. Um, if you want to play with it yourself, there's a Sparkle endpoint and Jupyter Notebook available. Here you see a little part of the Jupyter Notebook. Um, and what you see in this Jupyter Notebook, how we load events 2018 into a Lego graph. We add a unique integer to each node and relationship in the graph, right? And then we do a query to collect all the node IDs, relationship IDs, and event dates from a Lego graph. You split the data like you always do in training, validation, and tests. And then you define a graph neural network model and data set abstraction by PyTorch, and you train it, and then you store the learned model in a Lego graph. And then for your graph neural network, you have to create your own magic predicates. And now you have integrated your graph neural network model directly into a Lego graph. I think we're the only ones that do that right now. Um, and there's also this Sparkle endpoint. Let me just show you how you can get into our Sparkle endpoint, right? So what you do, let me see here. Do I have, here I have uh, my browser and my, Let's see, how do I get rid of that Zoom thing at the top? I can't look at my browser bar. Okay, we have, um, uh, we go to this website, https colon slash flux.france.com. Now I've put this link at the end of my presentation. So don't worry about right now. When you're looking at this, I go here and then I'm going to my own account. You can get in by going to demo, demo, so username demo, password demo. And if you get in there, you'll see, you will only see demos by the way here, you go to demos, right? And then here you have events 2018. So you open this database and I have to get rid of the zoom bar at the top, right? So now you have um, uh, the, um, the, the, the web interface to uh, the events 2018 knowledge graph. Um, if you wanted to look at some triples, you could just do it this way and you would see the bunch of triples. Usually that's not very interesting, right? It's way more interesting to double click this thing here. And now you get um, graph is started up. And if you look at this here, then um, so this is the graph view. If you want to get something on the screen, this click on this one and then do display some sample triples. And at some point you'll see uh, a, a graph uh, appear in your screen that you can play with. 
but let me throw this away here. You can also go to the query view, view, and then you say query view, and then you can say load some query text. And here you see a bunch of queries that we predefined, like find Mali science agreement with the World Bank here. And here you see the query, you get some results, and then you can, I think, create a visual graph from this, right? So anyway, this is how you can play with the data. I'm not gonna, this is not a graph demo, so let's not go too deep into this. Um, but one more thing, okay, let's get a bit of the graph. If you wanna learn how to do predictions, there's two predefined queries, predict object and predict subjects, just to show you here. And here you see how you can, if you know the event number, here, then you can just say, give me every X and predict object with this event. And if you execute that query, then you get a number of things, right? So this is a whirlwind tour through AG WebView, but you can pause the video while you're looking at this. But anyway, this is how you can get to this own Sparkle endpoint, right? So now let me go back to my presentation. We're almost done uh, here. Right, and let me do this. So then um, we also apply this in the medical domain and the aviation domain. Um, if you, we, I, we can't give you this particular data, of course, because this is real customer data, both for aviation and, and healthcare. But if you want to have a demo, please call us up, and we're always happy to show you. But in the AVA, but why do we use GNN in the medical domain? Well. Let me first show you something. Say you have a symptom like allergy to peanuts. Yeah, so we have a, a graph, uh, an, an entity event knowledge graph for 2 million patients on a cluster of machines, right? So once you have all the data, you can do cool things like what is most related to allergy peanuts, right? Well, if I click on run query here, then you see that this little Sparkle query is created and you see that most related to peanut allergies, dermatitis, asthma, asthma, dermatitis, and acute upper respiratory infections. So if I turn this into a visual graph, I get this, uh, I get this graph. So you see allergy to peanuts very much related to dermatitis. Sometimes you wanna know, hey, are the relationship between these guys? So I can actually draw a, draw a line around all of these and find of the shortest path. And then I get here, and now you see all the statistical relationships between these, right? So now you see already a probabilistic graph just based on core statistics. But you can also look at this graph. So remember this graph, with the, and, and each of these things is a, a, a particular symptom, but they're all linked in a knowledge base of medical terms and the hierarchy of medical terms, right? So Normally, when you do predictions, you only look at a series of events of this particular type, but you always ignore that there's a wonderful knowledge base that describes these things. And if you want to do entity prediction, you also have to look at the relationships in this graph, right? That's the unique thing that graph neural networks can add to your prediction models. And you can even combine them, right? Here is allergy to peanuts with the top things related, but also here, so what you can do with graph neural networks, use both the statistical relationships and the knowledge base to come up with predictions, right? So now we can do queries like select the next disease and its chance where there's a patient, there's the next disease, and then you see the chance of this particular uh, uh, disease, right? So that was it for today. Uh, call our writers and we'll get you going with the Lego graph and graph neural networks. If you want to play yourself, Go to this particular address, Flux of France and Chrome 10,000, use this demo, password demo, and let us know what you think. Thank you very much.